Good day, and welcome to another episode of The League of Biblical Enthusiasts. Bible translations have been the center of controversy from the very beginning. If we start with Jerome, his certainly had its detractors in the early days, to the Wycliffe's Bible, to William Tyndale and his illegal translation, to the Geneva Bible with its anti-Catholic and anti-monarchical footnotes, and even to the present. There's always someone to criticize the translators and the translation. Now, although it has survived quite well, the Revised Standard Version had an especially rough start. This episode and the next deals with two different eras of scandal with the Revised Standard Version. The first at its initial publication in the early 1950s, and the second scandal in more recent times. So, we entitled this episode, The Great RSV Controversy, Then and Now. I produced an earlier video on the Revised Standard Version that will serve as a general introduction to that translation, and I'll link it in the description below, so you can watch at your leisure. Please like and subscribe and share this channel with others if you find the information helpful to you. And we hope it is a, a channel that is educational and informative. But for now, sit back and enjoy as we continue discussing the Revised Standard Version and its controversies. Brought to you by the ever faithful League of Biblical Enthusiasts. In this episode, I rely on my own personal study notes with assistance from a really good book by Mr. Peter J. Thusen entitled In Discordance with the Scriptures, American Protestant Battles Over Translating the Bible. In his acknowledgment section, Thusen says that Bruce Metzger granted him unrestricted access to the uncatalogued RSV committee papers. This proved to be a wealth of information for his work, and it's been extremely informative to me as well. Let's start with a brief review of the RSV. If you remember our earlier episode, the RSV was a revision of the American Standard Bible of 1901. And the Old Testament portion of the Revised Standard Version was produced and released in 1947, the completed Bible on September 30th, 1952. The RSV was sponsored by the National Council of Churches, and the hope was that it would become an ecumenical Bible, favorable to both Catholics and Protestants. This was a most optimistic hope. The RSV Translation Committee was headed by Luther Weigel, at that time head of the Yale Divinity School, and the completed RSV was announced to the world with great fanfare in 1952. The newly constituted National Council of Churches made plans for a large nationwide celebration of the new translation. A goal of 3,000 simultaneous celebrations was readied for the RSV's publication date, September 30th, 1952. Publishers Weekly reports that half a million dollars was spent on marketing and events, and that was the largest promotional budget ever spent on a single book at that time. As a prelude to the fanfare, Luther Weigel was invited to the White House and presented the first copy of the RSV, which was a hand-bound edition in red Morocco leather, to President Harry S. Truman. An unprecedented first printing of nearly a million copies of the RSV rolled off the press. 
and on the night of September 30th, 1952, 3,418 communities held Bible observances in honor of the RSV. For example, 16,000 gathered at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, 6,000 in Indianapolis, nearly 3,000 in Seattle, and other large cities had multiple smaller celebrations as well. Unfortunately, the enthusiasm for the RSV was not to last. Fundamentalist preachers were quick to denounce it. One such pastor was Martin Luther Hux. Hux was trained at the Southeastern Baptist Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina, but he was disappointed in what he believed to be the liberal theology taught there. He became estranged from the North Carolina State Baptist Convention, withdrew his membership, and in 1946, he began to lead an independent Temple Baptist Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. He became upset that the RSV translators removed the virgin birth from the Bible. He noted that in Isaiah 7:14, we no longer had a virgin, but a young woman who would bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, a footnote in the RSV noted an alternate reading as virgin, but this did not satisfy Martin Luther Hux. On Sunday night, November 30th, 1952, he announced to his congregation he would hold a public burning of the Revised Standard Version, which he referred to as the Unholy Bible. His plans were quickly picked up by the Associated Press and headlined as Pastor Plans Public Burning. The local fire chief, W.B. Parrish, warned Huck of the dangers of open flames in public buildings. Well, the time rolled around and Hux preached a lengthy two-hour sermon that night entitled The National Council Bible, The Master Stroke of Satan, One of Devil, the Devil's Greatest Hoaxes. And upon finishing his sermon, he led his congregation out into the night lawn and gave everyone a small American flag. He hopped up onto the bed of a pickup truck, held high his copy of the RSV on which he had written the word fraud. He ripped the pages out that contained Isaiah 714 and burned it in full view of the crowd and shouted, this has been the dream of modernists for centuries to make Jesus Christ the son of a bad woman. Although there were reports that his bravado doubled the size of his church, many North Carolinians did not approve of his stunt. And despite the outcry, he continued his campaign against the new RSV with a tract entitled Modernism's Unholy Bible. Unfortunately, his book-burning incident was not to be a one-time event. For on January 5th, 1953, Luther Weigel, the chairman of the RSV Committee Translation, received a metal box by registered mail. It was sent from a Bill Denton, a radio evangelist and pastor of the Furnace Street Mission in Akron, Ohio. The church was aptly named Furnace, for in the metal box was a note that read, Dear Sir, you will find enclosed the ashes of a book which was once called the Revised Standard Version of the Holy Bible. Well, as we've said before, Bruce Metzger made the comment that, well, at least nowadays they burn the translation and not the translators, like in the days of Tyndale. So throughout the 1950s, anti-Revised Standard Version literature continued to flow from fundamentalist preachers and their literature. One was entitled, The New Perversion of the Bible. Well, two decades later, a Church of Christ preacher by the name of Foy E. Wallace Jr. devoted 170 pages to uh, exposing the errors of the RSV. And this was done and is still being done in some circles today. The 1950s was also the era of McCarthyism where communists and their sympathizers were found behind every rock and every tree. And in a strange twist of fate, the Revised Standard Version was caught up in this accusation. 
There was a Myers G. Lohman who led a Methodist organization named Circuit Riders. It was an anti-communist organization from the start. Lohman distributed a booklet that alleged 30 members of the RSV Translation Committee were affiliated with communist or pro-communist fronts. The RSV controversy even found its way into the military. In 1960, the U.S. Air Force Reserve published a counter-subversion training manual that warned new recruits to avoid the communist-tainted RSV. And so it was that James Wine, Associate General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, testified in a hearing before the Committee on Un-American Activities at the House of Representatives, and he demanded that all copies of that manual be recalled immediately. And it was so. There's a fascinating record of this conversation and this meeting that I'll link to in the description below. But it's not over yet. The RSV also became involved in state politics. Reverend Carl McIntyre was a vehement crusader against the Revised Standard Version and his influence eventually infiltrated the Michigan State Legislature. Two Republican state senators, Alpheus P. Decker, Charles R. Feenstra, introduced a resolution that prohibited the sale and dissemination of the Revised Standard Version. They cited Isaiah 7.14 and other passages that they believed were evidence of, and I quote, the general trend to bring into question the unique sonship and deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they continued, our national security is threatened by the undermining influence of grossly radical and godless ideologies. And you thought the conservative Republican right was a new thing. <laughs> Wrong. Not by a long shot. As you can see, Bible translations can create extremely strong feelings and have repercussions far beyond their intended readership. Well, the national hoopla over the RSV began to subside over time. And yes, there are still critics, but the firestorm of the early days are over. Or are they? Maybe not. On December 1st, 2023, a movie was released with this title, 1946, The Mistranslation That Shifted Culture. Now, this film is a featured documentary that follows the story of tireless researchers who trace the origins of the anti-gay movement among Christians to a grave mistranslation of the Bible to 1946. Now, just what translation would this film be accusing of a grave mistranslation? You guessed it, the Revised Standard Version. And so that's the subject of our next episode. If you found this episode and others helpful, again, please like, subscribe, and share with others to help grow the channel. In the meantime, stay tuned for part two of the RSV controversy then and now. Until then, be well, and thanks for subscribing to The League of Biblical Enthusiasts.